Do you work with DynamoDB? And want to know how to work out which of the pricing methods is best for you? Well, in this video, that is exactly what I'm going to be showing you how to do. Hi guys, my name is Sam with Complete Coding, where our aim is to make you into the best developer that you can be. Make sure you stick around to the end of this video as I've got a bit of an announcement to make. In this video, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at the two different payment methods for DynamoDB, looking at a couple of di different situations to see how the pricing and the functionality changes with the different payment, payment method, and then comparing to see which would be best in each situation. Of course, this is all my own opinion, but you could use this to help make the decisions for your own architecture and platform. So to start, we need to look at the two different kinds of payment methods. So the first method of payment is the pay per request, which is exactly as it sounds. In this payment method, you pay only when there is a request made, but it will be processed no matter what. There are no limits or restrictions on how many requests can be made. The second type is provisioned capacity. This is where you are reserving a certain performance of access to your database, and that is paid on an hourly basis. So if you know you have a certain amount of requests you're going to make, you say that I want to have this many requests, and then that is provisioned for you. If you go above that, then those extra requests are throttled and aren't properly processed. Now, a caveat to that second method is that DynamoDB allows you to use auto scaling. And this is where you can set a threshold for what you want your provisioned capacity and your usage to be at. A normal and a common usage threshold is 70%, which means if your usage goes above that 70%, of your provisioned capacity, then it is going to scale up the amount of provisioned capacity that you have so that you never get those throttled cases. The way that it scales up is really important because it scales up if there have been two consecutive minutes where it has been above your set threshold. This is key as we'll be pointing out some little things to do with this as we look at some of our examples. It also scales down. So that works if there are 15 consecutive minutes where it is 20% less than your target threshold. So if your target threshold is 70%, if the utilization is less than 50%, for the whole of 15 minutes, then it will start scaling back down. Now that we know the two payment methods, uh, we can look at some examples. So the first example we're gonna look at is the consistent usage. This is where you approximately know that your usage is going to be the same throughout the time that you're gonna be using it and therefore the auto scaling doesn't need to go up or down very much at all. This might be a use case such as you have some equipment that posts back its status every couple of seconds. In this case, the only time that you're gonna have a significant increase or decrease is when you add or remove some different equipment. In this case, you can see that it is 23 eight times more expensive to use pay per request than it is to use the provisioned capacity. So in this case, if you know it's going to be consistent 
I'd definitely go with the provisioned capacity. The next type is when you have cyclic usage. So this might be that you have a period of time throughout your day where, for example, if you're a shopping website, you have more shoppers. So you have more shoppers at lunchtime and just after work, but then you have dips in the number of shoppers at two o'clock in the morning. With this, because the increase and decrease of your users is gradual over time, then it, DynamoDB will be able to scale up and scale down effectively enough. In your use case, just make sure that the number of requests doesn't reach your threshold in 10 minutes. So if your threshold is 70%, make sure that in every 10 minute block, the number of requests isn't going up by more than 30%. If that's the case, then DynamoDB will be able to scale up absolutely fine to be able to meet your demands. In this case, you can see that this is slightly less of an expense if you did go with paper request, but it is still significantly more. So in the two previous examples, the decision was pretty simple, but the next three is a little bit more complicated. So the first use case is where you have a consistent base usage, but then you have significant spikes and those spikes last for a couple of minutes, which triggers your auto scaling. So in this example, it might be something like you have a stock management tool where most of the time there are a couple of requests a second, checking on stock levels or when someone makes a purchase, adjusting those stock levels. But once a week or once every couple of days, you have a delivery of thousands of items, which you upload in a CSV. And over the period of three or four minutes, those have to get loaded into your DynamoDB table. In that case, what you can see is that there is a massive spike in the auto scaling reserved and provisioned capacity to deal with this increase. But what you find is that because after those four minutes, there is a drop off, there are huge areas of unre unused reserved capacity. Now this isn't great because you're paying for that, but not using it. In this use case, it is sometimes cheaper to use pay per request, but that depends on how big your spikes are and how often they occur. Another thing to note is because this spike went way above the capacity that was provisioned, there are going to be some failed requests. These requests will fail before the DynamoDB has scaled up. So you need to think about how you're going to deal with the fact that some of the requests to Dynamo will be throttled. The next type of use case is where you have a consistent usage, but with short little spikes occasionally. In this use case, the spikes are short enough. This may be a couple of seconds where you don't have that two minutes of consistent throughput, which is high enough to trigger the auto scaling. So what happens is you just have these spikes where any requests beyond the provisioned capacity are throttled. So this may actually be ch uh, cheaper for you using the reserved capacity by about 28 times. But the issue is that 10 to 15% of your requests will fail as there isn't the capacity to deal with them. So this is obviously a major issue. And the final example 
and the one that is probably going to be applicable to a lot of the developers watching this is the occasional usage. So this might be that you've built a project on your own outside of work or that you've got a proof of concept that you're building as a way of demonstrating what your company can do to your clients, but it won't be a production workload. This means that you may have a few requests every now and again. It could be that you have maybe a couple of requests a minute, or even that you build it and don't touch it for three weeks and then use it again in three weeks time. In this case, because most of the time your capacity is unused, it will be significantly cheaper to use paper request. That's because you need to provision a minimum capacity so that when you do use it, if you're using the provisioned capacity, it can actually provide that dynamo response. Even with that minimum capacity provisioned, you will still have failed requests if there are spikes when you do use the tool. So those are the examples and my opinion on which of the payment methods you should go with. But with the last three, when you're calculating what the ratio of cost is for you, then it's not just about the cost of the AWS Dynamo DB. So in this example, where we had a consistent usage with short spikes that didn't trigger the auto scaling, you can work out exactly what it's gonna cost a month. With pay per request, it's gonna cost me $22.60 a month, but with provisioned capacity, it's only $0.78. Looking at that straight off, you'd instantly decide to go with a provisioned capacity. But there are extra costs that are involved. If you're going with provisioned capacity, you need to analyze every single time you create a new DynamoDB table, if you think there will be spikes in your usage which could go above the provisioned capacity. If there are, you then need to build into your system a way of catching the requests that are throttled, storing them in your Lambda, and then retrying them later. What happens if those retries fail again? Well, then you need to include exponential backoff and the complexity increases by magnitudes. So if you had an amazing developer and it might take him or her five hours to build that system with the exponential back off and all of the throttling capabilities, then you need to account for that in your expenses. If your developer costs just $50 an hour, for five hours, that's an extra $250. That means with a cost, with paper request of just $22, you would need to run this system for over 11 months for that to be worthwhile. The issue with that is because you've got all of this extra code, the chances are that someone is going to need to reuse it. Someone is going to need to update it and maintain it. For every hour that it takes a developer to maintain or update that code, it is making the cost for your provisioned capacity significantly higher. So just make sure that you consider these costs when deciding whether to use paper request or provisioned and not just the AWS costs. In this video, we have looked at both paper request and provisioned DynamoDB with auto scaling. We've then looked at some scenarios and how our usage of DynamoDB can affect both the cost 
and the performance of our database. These two things in conjunction can affect which of the payment methods we should go for if we want to produce the best results for our systems. As I mentioned at the start of this video, I have a bit of an announcement. I've actually gone full time and quit my job so that I can do YouTube and AWS consulting full time. So if you work for a company that uses AWS, but needs a bit of extra support, or if your company is looking to move across to AWS and serverless, but need some help migrating your systems across or getting started on the cloud, then there's a link in the description below where you can fill out a form and I'll get in contact with you to see how I can help. So you'll see more videos coming out soon and I'll see you in one of those videos.